Thank you so much for joining us today in our Be In The Know series on lung health, tobacco cessation, and vaping for health professionals. This series is brought to you by Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, Screen NJ, and Tobacco Free for a Healthy New Jersey. There are still several sessions available that you can still register for. We'll place the registration link in the chat box where you're going to be greeted by my wonderful colleague, Evelyn Fuertes, who will be moderating our chat today. She'll also be able to take any questions that you have during our session and forward them to our presenter, Heather Jordan, to address at the end of today's session. Today's Zoomcast will provide you with an overview of tobacco treatment. This session is presented by Heather Jordan. Ms. Jordan is a research program manager at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and the Center for Tobacco Studies at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. She currently coordinates the Tobacco-Free Healthy New Jersey Quit Centers and Healthcare Provider Lung Cancer Screening Education for Screen NJ. She's also a part-time PhD student in the Department of Health Behavior, Society, and Policy at Rutgers School of Public Health. She holds a master's degree in public health with the concentration in maternal and child health from the George Washington University. She's also completed the Rutgers Tobacco Dependence Program four-day tobacco treatment specialist training program, and she's provided tobacco treatment in the Newark, New Jersey area for several years. So without further ado, we're so excited to present Ms. Heather Jordan. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's late in the day for most of us, so please make sure you've grabbed yourself a drink of water or a cup of coffee like I have. We're gonna take about 60 minutes of your time this afternoon and go over an overview of tobacco treatment. As previously noted, this is one talk of a five-part series. We invite you to sign up for the other sessions of this series. We're going to drop the registration link in the chat box for you. I've also listed my email address here. So if you have any questions or comments that we don't address during the talk or you don't put them into the evaluation, please feel free to send me an email and we can have a conversation to follow up on this talk. Also, if you have any organizations out there that might be interested in having us do this talk for you directly, we're certainly happy to do that as well. So please drop me a line to start discussing those sorts of continuing ed or educational opportunities as well. Before we get started, I do want to go over a few general housekeeping items for you. All microphones should be muted during this session. We do, however, want to hear from you, so please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box, and you may type in any questions in the chat box you have during our talk. We do have Evelyn out there taking a look at that chat box, and she'll be able to circle back on questions you type in when we're all done at the end of the talk. So at the end of that talk, we will spend some time doing the Q&A. If we do run out of time, don't worry. We will be posting up a Q&A document and video to go over all of the questions that you all have after the session is over. Most importantly, we do want you to have some fun and we hope you learn something. So before I continue on, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn my video off for the recording and then we'll get started. Okay, so I like to start out these tobacco talks with a little bit of information about the health consequences of smoking to help ground all of us in the true importance of providing tobacco treatment to our clients and our patients. About 38 million adults do smoke, and about 1.1 million middle school and high school students report being smokers. Smokers have a 50% chance of dying from their smoking habit, and there are about 480,000 deaths in the United States each year that are due to smoking. That's about one in five deaths per year that can be attributed to cigarette use. This pie chart provides a breakdown of the 480,000 deaths. You can see here that about a third are deaths due to heart disease, close to a third are lung cancer deaths, about a fifth are COPD, and then there are other causes of death that are certainly associated with tobacco use as well. Quitting smoking is the most important thing a smoker can do to improve their health. It is never too late to quit smoking. Quitting smoking greatly reduces the risk of lung cancer and other health consequences of smoking. 
You can see in this graphic some of the health effects of quitting. You can see here that within a about 12 hours of a smoker's last smoke, their carbon monoxide levels in the body return to normal. Within about two weeks, lung function begins to improve. Then within about a month, coughing and shortness of breath start to decrease. And about one year post-quit date, the risk of coronary heart disease is about half of a current smoker's risk and so on there. So again, I just wanna reiterate, quitting smoking is the most important thing a smoker can do to improve their health. So we are going to go on to our first poll question of the day. True or false, smokers are addicted to nicotine. True or false, smokers are addicted to nicotine. And I see there that we have our poll up, so please go ahead and select your response. True or false, smokers are addicted to nicotine. We're gonna give it just a couple more seconds for folk to, folks to think about and then hit their answers. All right, let's go ahead. We're gonna close that poll, we're gonna move on. So very good out there. I see 93% of you say that is true. Indeed, nicotine is an addiction. And in order to help people quit smoking with tobacco treatment, we must first think about nicotine addiction and nicotine withdrawal. So during uh, the four-day training that we do here at Rutgers at our tobacco dependence program, we do offer a whole lecture about nicotine addiction and brain neurology. Um, so I certainly invite some of you to go ahead and look at tobacco dependence program and see if you would like to maybe sign up to, to take our four-day training. We are um, offering a training next week. Um, so in the meantime, because we don't have a lot of time, I just want to highlight a few things about nicotine addiction to help us think through tobacco treatment. So addiction is characterized by the inability to consistently abstain, impairment in behavioral control, cravings, diminished recognition of significant problems, dysfunctional emotional response, external cues do play a significant role in nicotine addiction, and there is a persistent risk of relapse. So we're gonna go ahead and do poll question number two. What is the fastest way to feel the effects of an administered drug? A, ingestion, B, inhalation, C, injection, and D, snorting. What is the fastest way to feel the effects of an administered drug? Ingestion, inhalation, injection, or snorting? We'll give you just a couple more seconds to make your choices. All right, we can go ahead and we can close that poll. So about 41% of you said inhalation, and inhalation is the correct response to this question. You can see here by this graphic that inhalation is indeed the fastest route of administration for drugs. It is important to remember that addiction is a brain disease Addictive drugs activate the reward system. Each drug has different receptors in the brain and specific mechanisms. Nicotine attaches to nicotine receptors in the brain. And when that happens, the receptors then release what's called dopamine. And dopamine is a major neurotransmitter. It's that thing that makes you feel good. So when dopamine levels drop, smokers may crave another cigarette to give that to give them that feeling again that they, that they crave. Biological changes happen with chronic use and better treatment has been developed based on our understanding of this particular neurobiology. There are three scales of dependence that can be used to assess nicotine dependence. They are the Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence, the heaviness of smoking mm -hmm. index, which is cigarettes per day and time to first cigarette, and the hooked on nicotine checklist. This here is the Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependence. You can see here the list of six questions that you can ask your clients or patients, and a score of five or more indicates significant dependence on nicotine. We know that people trying to quit their tobacco use will likely experience nicotine withdrawal. So I list those symptoms here for you as well. 
a patient can be diagnosed with nicotine withdrawal if they experience four or more of these signs and symptoms. So these symptoms are depressed mood, insomnia, irritability, frustration, anger, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, restlessness, and increased appetite and weight gain. These signs and symptoms cause significant distress and impairment, and they are not explained by another medical condition or medical disorder, including withdrawal from another substance. Okay, so this is a lot of information, right? So we know all of this. What do we do with it? Where do we even start to try to provide tobacco treatment? Well, we are in luck. We don't need to start from scratch. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Public Health Service developed this treating tobacco use and dependence clinical practice guidelines for us. This document is a culmination of a thorough review of published peer-reviewed randomized control studies. Um, approximately 6,000 articles were reviewed. And then each recommendation within the clinical practice guidelines um, is judged on the strength of evidence to reflect this consensus of the guideline panel. So for example, a grade of A means that there's strong evidence, multiple well-designed studies were um, consistent findings were there to, to be able to give that A grade. A B means there's good evidence from randomized control trials, but some studies are less coherent or not as uh, high quality. And then the C grade is reserved for important clinical situations where the panel achieved a consensus on this recommendation, but there were few relevant randomized controlled trials at the time around that issue. Included in this clinical practice guidelines document, this book, are some important takeaway points that I wanted to uh, give to you today. Um, the document says that tobacco dependence is a chronic disease that every patient who uses tobacco should be offered treatment, that clinicians and systems should identify and intervene with all tobacco users, and brief interventions such as AAR have an effect and that 5 A's model, which is also a brief intervention, is encouraged. There is a strong dose-response relationship between the intensity of tobacco dependence counseling and its effectiveness. So that means that effectiveness increases with treatment intensity. So the more minutes you spend with your clients and patients or the more sessions you spend with your clients and patients improves their ability to remain abstinent from tobacco use. The document further points out that individual, group, and telephone counseling are all effective in tobacco treatment. It says that three types of counseling and behavioral therapies were found to be especially effective. So the provision of practical counseling, like problem solving and skills training, uh, the provision of social support as part of treatment, and helping the patients to secure social support outside of treatment. Also, all of the FDA-approved medications are effective, and that counseling plus medication is more effective than either is alone, and the combination should be encouraged for all patients willing to make a quit attempt. Also, the document says that tobacco dependence treatments are very cost-effective relative to other common medical treatments, and they should be covered by all health insurance plans. So I, I discussed uh, the five A's and two A's and an R, so I wanted to just go over them briefly for you. The five A's are ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. For ask, that's where we want to try to identify smoker status, right? So every patient, we ask them if they're uh, using tobacco products or not. Most health systems and EMRs do have prompts to ask this question built into maybe the vital signs area. Um, so it's important to do that as our first step. Next, we advise. So for those that are using tobacco products, we wanna say quitting tobacco is the number one thing you can do to improve your health. And we want our messaging to be clear, strong, and personalized whenever possible. For those folks, we then moved on to assess. So we want to check their uh, readiness to quit smoking at this time. So if they say no, we might try to motivate them through the stages of change, try to get them to go maybe from, you know, uh, into pre-contemplation or the contemplation stage by um, giving them messaging that is personalized toward their, um, their smoking or their tobacco use. 
if they say yes, they want to quit, then we can go ahead and assist them with establishing a quit date. They could set their quit date, they could tell everyone, we could tell them to start to anticipate some challenges and work through some of what their anticipated challenges are. We might tell them to remove the tobacco products from their home. Um, you can help them think about and find social support. You can also advise them about counseling and some of the quit services we have available here in New Jersey. And you can also talk with them about the FDA approved stop smoking medications. So after that, you wanna think about a range. That's where we wanna schedule a follow-up with them shortly after their quit date. And we wanna to continue to follow up and to help them think through any relapse issues they might be facing. It's also important if you've got your clients and patients using a stop smoking medication to follow up with them after their quit date just to check to see if they're having any side effects from those medications or if they need a little bit more of the short acting medications. And we can talk about that a bit more later. Here I do provide a diagram of two A's and an R. Please consider joining us next week for our two A's and an R talk because we'll be devoting a whole session on this and referring patients and clients out to quit services. So I'm just briefly going to say that two A's and an R is ask, advise, refer. Ask if they're a tobacco user. Advise them they should uh, use they should stop using those products if they're willing to go ahead and want additional support we can refer them out to additional support and you can see there uh, in the bottom left box some of the supports that we have available here in New Jersey I do provide this handy CDC pocket card graphic for you, and I provide the source for you as well. You can go to the CDC website and find this. It is indeed exactly what it suggests it is. It's a pocket card, so it can be uh, printed out, uh, double-sided, laminated perhaps, and it fits nicely into a white lab coat or uh, any pocket of a sweater that you might be wearing. Um, and this shows you two A's and an R and some recommended national quit services, and it also shows you the five A's on the other side. So you need not have to remember all of these steps. You could have this pocket card available for your use with your patients and clients. I list here for you also the New Jersey cessation services we have available. We have New Jersey Quit Centers where they provide free individual and group counseling sessions across 12 different counties in the state. They, you need not worry exactly where your clients and patients are located. These Quit Centers can in fact provide services to any New Jerseyan if they call in and, and will guide them to the appropriate location. Uh, treatment specialists have been trained up either via our four-day training or other trainings to provide evidence-based counseling and services. They also have information and materials about lung cancer screening to give out to their clients as well. These quit centers do also have free NRTs available. So if you have clients who are on tight budgets or don't have a lot of money to spend on these sorts of things, they can certainly call the quit centers and maybe become a new patient there and uh, maybe be able to have their patches or gum or lozenge provided to them at no charge. So I do invite you to visit tobaccofreenewjersey.com to learn more about the New Jersey quit centers that we have here in, this, in New Jersey. We also have Moms Quit Connection for Families and Quit for Kids. I provide the information for this service for you as well. They can go to Quit for Kids for more information. And we do have our free New Jersey Quit Line, 1-866-NJ-STOPS. This is a free telephone-based counseling service. Uh, I give you the website there as well. And at this point in time, I believe the Quit Line is also able to offer out some free NRT as well. So that's a really good resource for those of you out there that are working with clients and patients who, who might need the free services in order to uh, help them with their quit attempt. All right, we're going to switch gears now, and we're going to go to poll question number three. We're going to spend the rest of our time together talking about tobacco treatment medications and some other issues. So poll question number three is, there are blank number of FDA-approved tobacco treatment medications. There are two, four, seven, or ten FDA-approved tobacco treatment medications. We're going to leave that poll up for just another moment. 
there are blank number of FDA approved tobacco treatment medications. All right, we can go ahead and we can close that poll. I've taken my sip of coffee. I hope you all have as well. All right, so my poll says here that about 58% of you said seven, and seven is the correct response. All right. So here they are. There are seven FDA-approved tobacco treatment medications. You can see here there are five nicotine replacement therapies, patch gum, oral inhaler, nasal spray, and lozenge. And there are two non-nicotine medications, bupropion, otherwise known as Zyban Wilbutrin, or varenicline, otherwise known as Chansix. So why would we ever suggest that our clients or patients use nicotine replacement therapies as a medication to help them to quit smoking? Well, it works. There are clinical trials out there that have been done. NRTs roughly double the success rate of quitting smoking. NRTs help the patients feel more comfortable while they abstain. So remember earlier I talked about nicotine withdrawal symptoms. If the patients are using NRTs, such as the patch or one of the short-acting medications, they're providing a little bit of nicotine in their bodies, which will go up into the brain, into the nicotine receptors, and release a little bit of that dopamine. When that happens, it takes the edge off of the nicotine withdrawals, and it helps the patients and clients feel that a little bit more comfortable while they're making their quit attempt. NRTs are very safe. The patient isn't getting any new drug in their system. They're just getting the same nicotine they would pull in from their cigarettes or other tobacco products. And this nicotine is a less addictive form, and they're taking it in for a relatively short period of time. The reasons for not using NRTs? Well, there are certain medical conditions that require more caution and physician input. So for example, within two weeks of, a, of an MI or serious arrhythmia or during pregnancy. These issues are not contraindications. Rather, we just want to make sure that a patient's medical history is well known and we have physician input for certain um, health issues to make sure that these patients and clients are going down the right path with their quit attempt and the medication use. Clients or patients under 18 years of age should also have their physician and parental input in this process. And some patients might have some specific problems with certain products. So for example, they might say they have an allergy to the patch. Um, and we can talk about that in a moment. And then there are some patients and clients that just really don't want to use a medication to help them to quit smoking. They want to go cold turkey. And there, there are re reasons for doing that might be because they're, they don't have enough money to pay for the NRTs. They don't want another drug in their system. They might have safety concerns because they've heard something on the, uh, on the news or over the internet. So it's, job, it's our job as tobacco treatment specialists to be able to understand where the patient and client is coming from. Um, and if there is any misinformation, we want to be able to give them the proper information so they can make a very good informed decision about choosing the NRT they might want to use. So I'm going to talk about the, the transdermal patch right now. I do show you a picture. This is Nicoderm CQ, patch uh, steps one, two, and three. You can see here this is the clear version of the patch. It does come in, in different varieties and versions. It comes in generics. They're all the same. It's all fine. They don't have to use Nicoderm CQ. They can use any of the patches that are out there on the market. So to use this product, we say please apply it to clean skin. Maybe don't put lotion on and then just try to stick it right on the lotion because it won't stay, it will fall off and then it's not going to be able to do its job. We tell our clients to maybe start with the upper right arm and then we say, uh, leave it on for 24 hours because that will decrease your morning cravings, but then go ahead and rotate sites. So you're going to rip it off the, the one arm and you're going to stick a fresh one on the other arm. Um, so we rotate sites because, as you can see, one of the disadvantages is that some people say they have a bit of irritation from the patch. It's not from the nicotine. It's from the adhesive of the patch itself. So if that happens, we tell folks, all right, well, put a little cream or ointment on there, or if you need to, we can, you know, talk to your physician and, and get a prescription for some kind of steroid cream if you really need it. So that's why we suggest rotating sites. If we give our skin a little bit of an opportunity to heal up before we stick a new patch on that area, there might be a, a little relief from that irritation the patient is feeling. 
the patches do have steps. So it's important to monitor your clients and patients' nicotine withdrawals. If they're on that first step and they're getting through a few couple weeks and they're feeling all right, you can certainly step them down. If they're still saying that they're craving cigarettes terribly and having other withdrawal symptoms, you can certainly leave them on that step one for a little bit longer. It's okay. The advantage of this is that um, it is over the counter. Um, and then we also know that New Jersey Medicaid does cover this. So if patients are on New Jersey Medicaid, they can receive a prescription and go to the pharmacy and get the patches uh, via a, a prescription and get them for free. Another advantage of the patch is that you place it and you forget it. It's there, it's doing its job, it's providing a level, constant level dose of nicotine throughout the day and hopefully providing a bit of relief to the patients going through nicotine withdrawal. Uh, I did talk about the one disadvantage of the local irritation. Another disadvantage to, to make you aware of is that it is, it's passive, right? So it's sitting on their arm. There's really not much else they can be doing about it. Um, you know, sometimes patients will say, oh, I'm having a terrible craving. So they sort of rub on their patch or they kind of love on it a little bit and look at it. Um, that's not going to get the nicotine to go in any faster, but it just sort of gives them something to feel like they're doing. Um, so there's, but there's nothing really else they can do if they're just using the patch to get through that craving that they're having if, if it hits them very hard. So we're gonna move on to the next NRTs, which are short acting. So this will help if they're feeling the, 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 the effects of the passive patch, right? So here is a picture of Nicorette gum. This is our four milligram original flavor. Um, Nicorette gum um, or nicotine gum comes again in, uh, from different brands. There is generic. Uh, there are flavors now. They come in four milligram or two milligram doses. Um, some very large boxes, 110 pieces, uh, or some smaller boxes. You can find these um, over the counter as well. So you can find them, you know, at Walgreens, other pharmacies, Walmart and Target have them. Um, so what we tell our clients and patients for the use of this product is we say, chew it a little bit until you start to feel that peppery flavor or something else happen in there. So you know you've sort of opened it up and, and, the, and, the, and the nicotine is coming out. And then we tell them to park it. And what we mean by that is and, um, hold it in your mouth kind of like you would hold um, a cough drop or a lozenge. We don't want them chewing it and chewing it because if they continue chewing on it, the nicotine is being washed down into their stomach and being digested instead of sitting in the cheek and being absorbed into the bloodstream and going up into the brain to do its job. Um, this use is as needed. So if a patient or client um, wants to sort of use it when they would have otherwise had a, a cigarette break or um, they feel a craving coming on or they feel a trigger coming on, they can just kind of pop a piece whenever they need it. Or we have some clients who go on a fixed schedule of it and they say they're going to take, you know, one piece of gum in their mouth every hour on the hour or every two hours, um, up to 24 pieces a day. Um, I actually have somebody I know of, I, uh, I love dearly, who, who used several pieces of gum throughout the day and even more at night when he used to smoke cigarettes. So, um, you know, it's really dependent on what the client needs and that's why it's called short acting. It, it gives a pow of nicotine um, and, and, the, and the client is sort of in control of their dosing. So that's the advantage, right? So it's as, as needed and active. And we also have found that folks that use nicotine gum say they have less weight gain while they're using it, perhaps because instead of, you know, having a snack or something, they're putting the gum in their mouth and they're using that to get through their cravings. So some of the disadvantages, um, the, you, you, you should not be eating or drinking a beverage when you're using this because there's decreased absorption. Like I said before, if the person choo-choo-choos or washes it down with a cup of coffee, the nicotine's going down into their stomach being digested rather than the nicotine sitting in the mouth and being um, absorbed through the, the, the cheek, right, in, uh, into the bloodstream and going up into the brain, into the nicotine receptors. 
we do have some clients who tell us that uh, this gum is really hard to chew. It's making my jaw hurt. And that's a teachable moment where we can say to the clients and patients, well, you shouldn't really be chewing on it that hard anyway. You're supposed to chew it a little bit and then park it. So there's sort of that aha moment where they realize that, you know, maybe they haven't been using the product quite right. And um, so if they adjust, then usually their jaws aren't hurting as badly. And again, there is this nausea that pops. And so again, we have to say to the clients, well, you're probably feeling nauseous because the nicotine is, is washing its way down into your stomach and um, you're starting to, to digest it rather than you parking it and keeping that um, gum up in your cheek. The nicotine lozenge is also over the counter. It's similar to the nicotine gum. I do show you here, this is the Commit brand. This is the two milligram brand. Uh, again, there are generics out there. There are large packages, smaller packages, four milligram and two milligram. So this is, an, again, a short acting NRT where the patient or client can pop one in their mouth when they're feeling a craving coming on, or you can um, tell them, you know, take them on a schedule if you want to as well. What we found with this one is that um, there's higher blood nicotine levels than gum. So the lozenge does get a little bit more nicotine into that bloodstream and the nicotine up into those nicotine receptors more so than the gum. Otherwise, it's quite similar. Uh, what we tell our clients about the lozenge is please allow it to dissolve in your mouth. Please don't chew it. If you chew it up and you swallow it down, you're just going to send it down into your stomach where you're going to digest the nicotine and, and that's not going to do any good to your nicotine receptors up in your brain. The next product I'm going to talk about is the nicotine oral inhaler. This is by prescription, so they cannot go to the pharmacy and pick this up off the, off the shelf. They've got to have the prescription. Um, you can see here I do provide a picture of it. You can see it's a handy dandy little uh, contraption. There's, there's no electronics. It's uh, it, it kind of maybe similar to maybe an e-cig that you know, people might be using these days. You can see there's these, these little cartridges here. You pop the cartridge into the plastic mechanism and as you shut it, as you close it and snap it back together, it uh, pops open the cartridge. You can see that foil circle there on the inside of the cartridge. Once that happens, the nicotine is inside that little cartridge. It looks sort of like a, a cotton ball, like a, a, a Q-tip maybe. And so the patient puts that oral inhaler in their mouth and they just puff on it. They don't pull it down into their lungs like a cigarette uh, because we want them to keep that cloud of nicotine uh, in their mouths for the oral absorption to happen. So if they pull it down into their lungs, it's not doing its job effectively. So uh, again, this is a short acting, so they can use it as needed or on a fixed schedule. So if you know, we have clients and patients who say they make it basically through a day and then they're smoking a half a pack a day from the time they leave work to the time they get home, well, if they can have this oral inhaler instead sort of sitting in their purse or in their pocket, they, when they leave out of work or hop in their car or whatever it is they're doing, instead of pulling out a cigarette or other tobacco product, they can pull this one out and they can get a little hit of nicotine from it, which should take the edge off of a nicotine withdrawal symptom and provide some relief so they can try to stay abstinent from their tobacco use. So you can see here the advantage that I did describe. It is as needed, it's active, and it does provide this oral to hand behavior that our uh, cigarette users are sort of used to doing. Um, some of the disadvantages here are um, some throat irritation and some cough in the first couple of days because it's different. It's not the same as smoking a cigarette. So they've got to get used to this new feel that's happening for them. We, we do want to just understand our patient's medical histories, right? If there's some asthma or other lung issues, we just want to understand that in the medical history. Perhaps have some caution around that, especially because there were other short-acting NRTs that that patient might want to use instead. Um, and some patients and clients have said, nah, I don't want to use that oral inhaler. It looks a little funny. It's visible. People can see it. I don't want people asking me questions about it. And that's okay uh, because we have other NRTs that we can offer to a client if they think this one is just not right for them. 
And finally, this is the fifth NRT. This is also by prescription. This is the nicotine nasal spray. You can see here, I, um, the, the graphic we have here shows you how, how big, it's not very big, it's a couple inches in size. So it's, it can be discreet, they can pop it in their purse or in their pocket. Um, we tell them to, to spray it in the nostril, but don't sniff and inhale it very hard, right? We just want that, that puff to be sitting up in the nasal cavity, right? And, and the uh, nicotine will be absorbed through the, the nose and into the blood. And then from the blood will go up into the brain and get into those nicotine receptors to then release the dopamine that will take that edge off of that craving, hopefully. So as you can imagine, the advantage of the nicotine nasal spray is the rapid onset of it, right? Your nose is very close to your brain. There's not a whole lot of uh, real estate there for the nicotine to have to travel to get up to the brain to the nicotine receptors. The other advantage of this is, again, it's a short acting um, and it's as needed. There, it's an active thing they can be doing. If they feel a craving coming on or withdrawal symptoms coming on, they can give themselves um, a, a, a spray. The disadvantages are that many clients and patients do tell us they get a little uh, irritation from using this product um, and that um, there's questions about are people becoming dependent on this product due to higher dosage. We do want to caution use of this product with people with asthma, sinusitis, and rhinitis, especially thinking through the fact that there are four other NRTs that can be used. If somebody has severe sinusitis, maybe this isn't their, their, their thing, um, or, or maybe because the irritation is too harsh for them, maybe they try it, doesn't work, so we put them on a different short-acting NRT. It's perfectly fine. That's why we do the follow-up with our clients. I do want to take just a few moments to talk about the labeling. Um, it's important to, uh, for us as tobacco treatment specialists and, and folks out there um, in the field that are going to be working with tobacco users to be able to tell our clients and patients that there are no significant safety concerns with using NRTs. Um, and there's no significant safety concerns with using more than one NRT at the same time. So uh, we also want to make sure that our clients and patients understand that when they're using an NRT, let's say a patch or their gum or their lozenge, if they have a nicotine-containing product, let's say they have an oops moment and they smoke a cigarette, they should not discontinue using their NRT. They can continue to use it. You can have a patch on your arm and you can smoke a cigarette and it's, not, it's okay. Um, what we want to try to tell the clients and patients is though, okay, you had an oops moment, it happens, it's, it's okay. We want you to keep using that NRT. We want you to continue trying to quit using your tobacco products. So when, uh, like at the quit centers, when they pick a quit day, uh, they begin using their NRT product on their quit day. So let's say we have a bunch of people who say, you know what? Friday, October 2nd is going to be my quit day. Well, we want to make sure that we've worked with them, we've gotten their NRTs, their prescriptions are filled if they want that route, and then on Friday, October 2nd is the day they're going to start with their NRTs. And it's okay if they don't immediately stop all tobacco products on October 2nd, but we want them to make a really good quit attempt and we want them to have their over-the-counter and prescription NRTs with them and on board. Also, users of NRT products should follow the, the labeling for use of the products, right? For example, 8, 10, or 12 weeks. However, if clients or patients feel like they're not over the hump, that their nicotine withdrawal symptoms, especially their cravings, are just too harsh, they, they're not ready yet, they can use the product for longer in order to quit. It's certainly safe to do that in most cases. Uh, we want them checking in with their healthcare providers or checking in with their tobacco treatment specialists. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is that they're using an NRT product. They're getting a little dose of nicotine every day and they're not smoking. So they're doing what's best for their bodies in that moment. I do provide some dosing information here. Um, it, it, and I'll leave that up for a moment for those of you that are prescription writers. And now I'm going to move on and we're going to talk about the two non-NRTs. So bupropion, here, here is the, the picture of Zyban. Um, 
this medication has dopamine and norepinephrine effects. It reduces cravings and withdrawals. Uh, the trials out there show that it improves abstinence rates for those that are on this medication while they're making their quit attempt. And the, the studies also show that less weight gain occurs while patients and clients are using this medication. I do provide some dosing information here. Um, for this medication, we generally have the, the patients and clients start this medication a week to 10 days prior to their quit date because we want their bodies to get that medication in there doing its job effectively before the quit date. And then they continue using this medication for 7 to 12 weeks or longer depending on how they're doing, how they're feeling, and how you know, when they're checking in with their healthcare provider. There are uh, some contraindications that we do want to point out for this one. Uh, folks with seizure disorder, eating disorders, electrolyte abnormalities, or those that are using MAOs um, should not be using this product. Um, this product is primarily metabolized in the liver, some in the kidney. So if you have a client or patient with severe liver disease, this might not be the medication that you would recommend for them to use for their quit attempt. There are a few side effects to note. Some patients and clients experience some insomnia. Um, for those that do experience that, uh, we suggest taking their second dose of their medication a little earlier in the day, earlier in the evening, and that might help with the problem with um, falling asleep and staying asleep. Some of the clients and patients uh, do say they have some dry mouth, some headaches, and maybe get a rash from this medication as well. I'm going to move on to Varenicline Chantix. This is the, the, the one that you've probably seen uh, advertisements for. I think there's a, a commercial with a turkey in it or something like that. I show you the packaging for Chantix, the tablets. Um, so this one is different. Um, it, it acts um, with the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotine receptor, and it's called a partial agonist antagonist. So what that means, and I'll show you a graphic in a minute, is that um, Chantix gets up into the brain and it attaches to the nicotine receptor and it blocks it so that when somebody smokes a cigarette or uses another tobacco product, the nicotine can't get into the receptor because the Chantix is already sitting in there. But also what happens is that it helps that receptor also release a bit of dopamine out into the system as well. So um, it can reduce withdrawal symptoms because it's actually doing the job. It, it, make, it tricks the brain into thinking it's gotten some nicotine when in fact it's not. It's gotten this medication instead. Um, this medication is not as addictive as smoke either. Um, and like I said, it, it does block that nicotine receptor from, or that nicotine from binding to the receptor. So what happens is um, if it's in the body, it's in the bloodstream doing its job, then a client or patient goes and has a smoke or, you know, uh, uses another tobacco product and it's not, the, 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 the cigarette isn't doing its job anymore. The, the patient's not feeling the dopamine effects anymore. And so they just sort of say, uh, this doesn't taste good anymore. I don't like it anymore. So that's how uh, some of our patients and clients respond to using the medication and what they say. So here's a handy dandy graphic for you if you're really interested in the neurobiology and what's happening. I'm going to just focus on panel C here because I want to make sure we leave time for some Q&A. So this is what I was describing before. The nicotine receptors would be the little Y shape, the blue things that you see. The varenicline chantix would be the L shaped purple doodads that are sitting in the receptors. So they're blocking the receptor. So that pentagon shaped thing, what would be the nicotine coming in the in from maybe the cigarette they just smoked can't get into the receptor it's blocked so it, it can't do what it's supposed to do and then in the meantime looking down at the bottom there you can see that a bit of dopamine is being released because the varenicline has sat itself into that receptor there are some side effects of chantix patients uh, report having some nausea uh, some mostly mild, some moderate, and then those that have severe nausea sometimes will discontinue use and hopefully we can get them onto a different medication instead. Some patients report insomnia. Some do report some abnormal dreams, some good dreams, some bad dreams, and a few patients do report some constipation. 
I do here provide uh, some dosing information as well, the protocol. Um, for this medication, they titrate up during week one, and then their quit date would coincide with day eight of the medication. And the, the medication um, comes in these blister packs, so the patient can follow right along with what they're supposed to be doing each day leading up to quit day. Uh, for this medication, we want to probably avoid or reduce the dosing for patients and clients with severe kidney disease. Um, and I give you a little bit more information. So, so here, uh, the duration of use is 12 to 24 weeks or longer. Um, there are some studies out there right now sh you know, showing that people that are on it a little longer are able to remain abstinent um, for a longer period of time with uh, the addition of 12 weeks of treatment. Currently, there are no trials for uh, women who are pregnant and no trials for people under the age of 18. So um, we would not recommend the use of Chantix for those clients and patients that fit into those categories at this time. I do want to point out the previous black box warning because sometimes our patients and clients remember hearing about this in the news. And we just want to go over this with all of you as you're out there um, educating your patients and clients about these medications. Um, some serious neuropsychiatric symptoms have occurred in patients taking varenicline. I, I list the symptoms here for you. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we want to be checking in with our patients and clients um, and seeing how they're doing, what kind of side effects they're experiencing. And patients should discontinue varenicline if these symptoms develop, and they should certainly be contacting you and, and, and their other healthcare provider, their team, um, if they're feeling some severe symptoms as described here. So there were adve adverse events that were reported to FDA. I list them here. Uh, it's important to note that, though, this is a one-way information flow. There was no confirmation or follow-back to sort of clarify the reports that were made to FDA. So there were some studies that were done looking at the side effects a little more closely. And you can see here I've listed out that information for you. If you're interested in those studies, we can certainly get you uh, more information about them. But at the very end, you can see here that 120,000 smokers in the UK uh, were uh, in, this, in, in this study, and there was no evidence that varenicline or bupropion increased depression or suicide compared with uh, NRTs. So the black box warning has been removed. Um, we always, when we're working with our clients and patients, want to understand the benefits and risks of using any medication and think through with the patient and their medical history the potential side effects of all of these medications, to be honest, and make sure that the patient and client understands the risks and makes an informed decision about what medication they might want to use during their quit attempt. And again, we need good clinical follow-up for all of our treated smokers, just to make sure that we understand how they're feeling and what they're going through. And importantly, tobacco treatment is not a quit, quick fix, right? We can give you a patch and we can give you some gum, um, but there's other work that needs to be done. This is providing a bit, of NR, a bit of nicotine so that we can take the edge off the withdrawal symptoms so that the patient and client can do the other things they need to do to remain tobacco-free in their lives. Um, I, I do show you a graphic here. We, we will have this document available for those of you that are online with us uh, this week. We'll be posting that up hopefully early next week with some other materials. If you would like this document where it lists out all seven products with the, the advantages and the disadvantages and some other information, please drop me an email and we'll make sure that we get this document to you. I do want to highlight that certain combinations of these medications have been shown to be more effective than patch alone. So I do show you here uh, some of the abstinence rates for using these products. So you can see here placebo would be cold turkey with no medications on board. And you can see the abstinence rate there is 13.8%. You can see the dramatic increase that occurs if patients and clients go ahead and use these medications during their quit attempt. Um, and you can see down at the bottom, if they go ahead and they use the long-term patch, the patch on their arm, plus using gum or spray, you can see that the abstinence rates increase much more compared to placebo. And then if they use patch plus bupropion, there's also a, a, a greater odds ratio there as well. 
So when, like I said before, when you're working with your patients or clients, uh, there are certain factors that each one might want to consider as they're making the choice for what medication they want to use, right? You want to talk with them about the effect, efficacy of these products. Certainly want to understand uh, medical history for each client. They want to understand what adverse effects or side effects they might have to deal with. Also, lots of times our patients and clients have previous experience using these medications, right? Lots of times patients or clients will tell us they've tried to quit on their own several times and they might have tried like every New Year's Day for the last five years, they put a patch on their arm and they're trying to make an attempt. It's important to understand the previous experience of these patients and clients because sometimes maybe the previous experience wasn't um, uh, they, they weren't using the product correctly and you can do some education there about perhaps using the gum. Please don't chew it too hard. Just park it in your mouth. Um, and that might help them make the decision on which medication they want to try to use. And we also do indeed want to take care to listen to patient preference and also listen to them if they're talking about cost or access to be able to get these medications. So here's a brief medication summary. There is no magic pill for quitting smoking. Uh, we wanna make sure that patients and clients understand we're gonna give them some of these medications to hopefully take the edge off for them to do the other work around triggers or whatever else it is, behavior modifications, so that they can make an honest to, and good quit attempt. NRT, bupropion, varenicline are all good first line choices for treatment. Uh, varenicline might be a better uh, single agent. However, there's a lot of ongoing evaluation of risks and benefits to varenicline by itself. Um, certainly combining multiple NRTs or NRT plus bupropion may have advantages. Um, we have lots of clients and patients that are using multiple NRTs at the same time through their quit attempt. Um, and there are some studies out there right now where, you know, maybe can we do uh, combinations with varenicline. So, you know, they're, they have this, they're taking this pill, this varenicline's in their system, but is it possible that maybe a short acting with the varenicline will help with the nicotine withdrawals, right? Because the varenicline goes up into the nicotine receptor, but there are a few receptors still left open up there. So, you know, in theory, maybe that NRT could get in there and kind of um, activate some of those other receptors to take the edge off of the nicotine withdrawals for these clients. Those studies are ongoing, um, so we have to wait and see uh, what, what comes of those. Here are some final thoughts for you, some takeaway messages. Quitting smoking is the single most important thing a smoker can do to improve their health. Nicotine addiction and nicotine withdrawal are real. The clinical practice guidelines provide evidence-based recommendations for delivering tobacco cessation interventions. Uh, healthcare providers should and can provide effective tobacco cessation interventions to their patients and clients. Individual group and telephone counseling are effective. There are seven FDA-approved tobacco cessation medications. They're all effective in assisting with quit attempts. And also, and, and New Jersey has several free tobacco cessation resources for healthcare providers and others in the community to refer their patients to. So that's the end of this talk. At this point, we have mm, only about eight minutes left to try to go ahead and uh, answer any questions that you drop in the chat box. So we have Evelyn out there who we're going to turn the microphone over to now, and she's going to go ahead and moderate that chat box for us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video back on for you as well. We can have a little dialogue here. Hey, Heather, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, actually, it looks pretty quiet on the chat front with questions. Um, someone was inquiring if the slides will be available. So yes, in fact, we are going to go ahead um, now that this session is over. We are going to be recording all of our talks and we'll be posting up the best one of the week to our YouTube channel. We'll also be posting up the slides. And like I said, I have that uh, one page document about the seven FDA approved medications. So we'll be posting that up as well. Um, and then for those of you who may not have a question now, but have one later, please feel free to send me an email. It's jordanhm at rwj, Robert Wood Johnson, ms.ruckers.edu, and I'd be happy to answer your questions there as well. So if anyone has any questions or if you, uh, you can throw it into the chat box. Okay, are there any quick fact sheets about the different NRTs that we can use when we're interacting with the public on one-on-one -on, -one on the issue? 
Sure, sure. And also, I'm going to put a plug in for our evaluation. I think, Evelyn, you're going to drop oh, that about right. evaluation uh, into the chat box as well. I'm so, fired. <laughs> you're, so, so, we, so Evelyn will drop an evaluation in the chat box. For those of you that are on the line, please feel free to fill out that evaluation. We do ask a question in there for, you know, if there's other topics you might want to hear about. We are always looking to do additional programming. So if there's a topic area you're most interested about, please drop it in the evaluation or drop me a, an email. And, and we can think on providing that as an, a future topic area. So to get back to the question that was asked, yes, we have handy dandy tools. There is the one tool I was describing that one diagram. It does list out the seven medications on that diagram with the pros and cons, some cost issues and other things. So we are working on making sure that document is most up to date and we will be dropping that on our website and other resource materials. So we'll be sure to send an email out to all of our participants with the link to where these materials will be located. If you can't find it, if you don't see it, you can certainly drop me an email and I can send that off to you probably early next week. Okay. Um, how do you educate physicians that do not want their patients, cardiology, trauma patients on NRT during inpatient visits? That's a great question. And um, so we get that a lot, right? We have, a, um, there are a lot of providers who are not on board with the tobacco treatment medications. So it's important to be educating providers about the benefits of getting their tobacco using patients and clients onto NRTs or other stop smoking medications before let's say surgery and whatnot. So it's important to make sure that the, that you are talking with those healthcare providers so they understand the risks and benefits of NRTs and other stop smoking meds. Um, and also, you know, maybe work within that team to uh, come up with a good strategy for working with those clients and patients maybe before surgery to help them out so that when they're in hospital, they're, they're quit from their tobacco products. And uh, do you use meds with e cigs and how do you dose? I knew that question was coming. We've gotten it a couple of times now, right, Evelyn? Yeah. So, so at this point, I'm also going to put in a plug for Evelyn, in fact, because one of our talks coming up in the next couple of weeks is going to be about all tobacco products and e-cigarettes. So we'll, we'll have a full hour to be talking about um, e-cig use um, so we'll, I don't want to uh, wait to talk about it though, but I will be out there to help answer questions during that talk as well. What we know right now is that there's not enough research about helping people quit using their e-cigarettes with these medications. So what we tend to do is kind of make uh, our, our treatment for e-cig use mirror cigarette use because it's very difficult to understand how much nicotine an e-cig user is pulling from that pod, right? E-cigs are so varied and different. So we can try to assess their nicotine dependence, and then we can offer them patches and other short-acting meds or the other medications for that matter, sort of based on what we would do if they were a cigarette user. It's, a, it's our best guess right now to try to figure out their dependence. And then we do have a follow-up question on the fact sheets. Are those available in other languages? That is a fabulous question. I cannot answer that here on this call right now. I would assume they are available in Spanish because CDC has gone and made most of their materials available in English and Spanish. Um, we will have to look into that. For the person that asked that question, you can drop me a note um, if you have a specific language you're, you're interested in learning about because the overall Screen and J team is always interested in making sure our materials are available to New Jerseyans speaking varied languages. So please drop me an email uh, at jordanhm at rwjms.ruckers.edu and we'll try to do some follow-up with you on that issue. And then someone was kind enough to provide a quit line plug. So cessation toolkit for providers is also available on njquitline.org. Yes, yes. There are a lot of resources available for the providers in New Jersey. Uh, you can go to the, the links that I provided in that slide, um, or you can just Google NJ Quit Centers and you'll come up with the overall website as well. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that looks like it's the end of our questions and comments. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending this session. Heather, this was super informative. We really appreciate your time and dedication. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you in future sessions. So next week, for the Ask, Advise, Refer session, a brief tobacco intervention model, that session will be offering one nursing CEU, or if you're a certified health education specialist, we can also provide one CHESS CEU as well. Um, so we also have those sessions at the same dates and times um, as our sessions this week. So we look forward to seeing you in additional sessions and be sure to check out our Screen MJ website. We'll be posting a link um, and e-blasting it to everyone that will have the link to the YouTube channel where this recorded session will be housed, as well as all of the question and answer sessions for this week and supplemental materials. So be sure to visit screennj.org and we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Stay healthy and be well. That is the end of my talk. I know we only have a couple minutes left for Q&A, but I am here and available to go ahead and answer some questions. So if Michelle and Evelyn want to go ahead and unmute, and if there's any questions out there that look really fun and fascinating, I'm here. Also, what we can do is put those, Q, those questions into a document, and we can go ahead and answer them. And then in a follow-up thank you email to all of you, I can do a Q&A document for you to answer your questions. Thank you, Heather. That was fantastic. Um, just very quickly, everyone, I've put a, an evaluation into the chat box. If you can all please take a moment to click on that link and fill out that uh, evaluation, we would really appreciate it. That helps inform our programs so we can continue giving you fantastic programming like we did today. Um, as far as questions, I feel like you touched upon them, but we only have a few questions that um, I'll go into. So the first one was, what are the contraindications for tobacco treatment medicines? The, the contraindications for, for all medications? Or just in general. Right. So um, for the nicotine replacement therapies, right, it's just NRT. So there's hardly any contraindications because they're already getting that nicotine when they're smoking their cigarettes and using other tobacco products. On the slides about Welbutrin and Chantix, I did write a little, uh, give a little information about contraindications. Um, we especially want to just think about people who have uh, liver disorder or kidney disorders, right? Because that, those are the organs where these medications are being processed. Um, it's really about understanding a patient's medical history. If folks out there in the audience have specific questions about specific patient issues, please send me an email and we'll have our medical director, Michael Steinberg, uh, chime in on answering any questions you have about contraindications. We want you to feel as comfortable as possible um, in prescribing these medications out to tobacco users. Okay. Um, so we also have, what happens if the patient is using some form of nicotine, re nicotine replacement and then smoking? And I think you addressed that as well um, within your presentation where that's okay, they can do that because it's, it's helping them um, with the nicotine with, because it's, it's not dangerous. Correct. What we tr I just turned my video back on. I don't know if y'all can see me. Here I am. Hello. It's good to see y'all. Um, so, um, so, right. So if a patient continues smoking while they're using the medication, of course, we're going to advise them, please, please try very hard to stop using your tobacco products. But if you have an oops moment and you smoke one cigarette, um, it's okay. Continue using your NRT. Do not discontinue use of your medications. Those things are there to help take the edge off of your cravings. If you have somebody though that's still smoking a pack a day, um, you want to really be talking with them and saying, look, are we really ready to make this quit attempt? Do we need to do other things to get you ready to make a good effort with this quit attempt? Great. And then again, um, something else that you addressed within your presentation was the length of time that people could be taking the NRTs. So for instance, someone had um, clients that benefited from 20 weeks. Sure. 
that is, that's perfectly acceptable. Again, our goal is to have these folks stop using their tobacco products. So if you can get somebody to set a quit date and not be smoking a pack a day, let's say, and instead they're using that gum or the, those lozenges for several weeks, we think that's perfectly fine because we're looking for a long-term abs abstinence rate. At six months, is that person still quit from using those tobacco products? Um, I, I have had several clients in the past who, you know, six months to a year later, every so often are still popping a piece of gum or a lozenge in their mouth. And, 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 and we find that's perfectly acceptable because the alternative is they might relapse back to using their tobacco products. Great. And um, how does uh, cigarette counseling change your suggestions? Cigarette counseling. Can you repeat the question? Cigarette counseling. How does cigarette counseling change your suggestions? E-cigarette. Sure. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, I, e I missed the E in there. How does E-cigarette, and I have a couple of questions related to that, yeah. where e-cigarette counseling change your suggestions, NRT for vaping, and then a dosing guide for vaping. So these are all tremendously important questions because the vaping uh, epidemic is so young. We're still trying to understand what does it mean? You know, what does dosing mean for e-cigarette users versus tobacco users? I do want to put in a plug for Evelyn, who is our moderator right now. She will be doing a talk about vaping during our five-part series. So please be sure to log in for that because we should be able to address some of those questions and concerns during her talk. But I will say that when we have e-cig users come into our clinics, we are treating them as tobacco users. They're still pulling in nicotine through that device, sometimes perhaps even more nicotine than a cigarette smoker would be pulling in. So they can still use patches. They can still use all of the medications that are available. Um, but we are finding that certain medication options are working better for those e-cigarette users. So what we'll do is we'll make sure during Evelyn's talk in a couple of weeks, we address these issues and we can certainly talk more about medications and other um, uh, clinical trials that are popping right now. But it's still so young, we don't have enough information to give specific recommendations just yet. And just one last question. Are there any preferences on choices of medication for age and or gender? Interesting question. Um, it's really more than talking about subpopulations, you know, uh, you know a, a young man versus an older woman. What we try to do, especially in our counseling, is understand each client individually and have them be a part of the process for picking the medication. So that one page document I showed you where we list out all of our meds and all of the pros and cons of them, you want to tell your clients, you know, all about these medications and let them help you determine what's best for them. So we have, you know, some, some men who might prefer using gum and lozenge because they can put it in their mouth and forget it. But we have some women who feel the same way. So I don't want to say that there's any um, particular recommendations based on those subgroups. It's more of you need to just know your client well enough to sort of have them help you make that decision with you for the recommendation. Okay, I lied. We have one more and question. The last one is if you smoke with a nicotine patch, does it increase dependence and the, well, more of the risk for a heart attack? So that's a really good question, and we get that one a lot. Remember, the nicotine patch is a constant level low dose of um, nicotine going into your blood through your skin throughout the day. Um, it's just this level constant dose. It's not giving that pow with the cigarette, right? So um, the research does not show that using a patch and having a couple smokes is going to increase the risk of heart attack. Again, like if the client is using their tobacco just as regular, you know, a pack a day or more, you really want to be thinking, okay, are you really ready to set your quit date? What's going on here? Um, because, you know, we want to be managing that and understanding what their motivation is. Great. Thank you, everyone, for all these fantastic questions. They were great. Michelle, yeah. I'll throw it off to you to end the session. 
Thank All right. you so much, everyone, for attending our very first session of Be In The Know. We look forward to seeing you for additional upcoming sessions. And if you're still interested in registering for the sessions, you're more than welcome to. We'll be sending email updates out on a weekly basis on a Sunday and Monday with all of the live links. So you're more than welcome. If you have additional time in your week, please pop in. We'd love to see you. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Be well and stay healthy. Thank you. So with that, I thank you. We're going to ask you to go ahead and type some questions into the chat box. I'm going to start my video now. Hopefully you'll be able to see me. Um, let's see if we can get this going. And I think we have Evelyn out there today who's going to be looking at those questions. Sure. So um, while people are typing them in, so one question we had, Heather, was does the uh, NJ quit line, sorry, Maya. My notes aren't scrolling. So does the NJ quit line provide a free NRT? That is a wonderful question. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, indeed. Uh, people who go ahead and use that NJ quit line can at this point in time get patches and I believe lozenges for free. So please go ahead. At, we're we're going to have Averly talking about two A's and an R and the quit line next week. So please join us next week to get more information about all of that. And then just something that um, Kelly had brought up is that clients are being refused coverage for lozenge and gum due to being OTC. Um, are these clients who are on um, private health insurance or the family, New Jersey Family Care would um, be my question. Medicaid. Okay. Interesting. So um, if, did you say this person's name is Kelly? Uh, Kelly McEwen. Okay, so Kelly, if you could, I see you right there um, in the chat box. Kelly, if you could send me an email to jordanhm at robertwoodjohnsonmeadowschool.com. I'm sorry, dot ruckers at edu. So rwjms dot ruckers at edu. Um, let's talk this through a little bit more. Maybe it's a question of talking with the pharmacist um, to see what's going on, or maybe the way the prescription is written isn't quite right. But let's get to the bottom of this to make sure that those clients can get their medications for free. Great. And then if someone is on Shantix and they are still smoking, can they still offer them any NRTs? So this is a great question. Um, and, and I guess I would need to do a deeper dive into uh, the use of the tobacco products, right? So is it somebody on Chantix who's like, oops, had a slip and they had one smoke each day, or are they still smoking a pack a day? Because there's different things we want to be talking about with them um, when they're still using their tobacco product. So, um, and I think you said Chantix was the medication, Evelyn? Yes. Okay, so with Chantix, that's that one where I was describing how Chantix gets up into the brain and it's sort of interacting with those nicotine receptors, right? So we're not sure right now if using an NRT in combination with Chantix is really effective. Um, there's some uh, information out there that suggests, yeah, maybe if they're on Chantix and they also have a piece of gum in their mouth, maybe that gum is kind of getting up into those nicotine receptors that are still open and available and releasing a bit more dopamine, which might take the edge off the craving. Um, you just want to make sure that you're monitoring your clients and their medical histories and any side effects they're feeling to make sure that you understand and your client understands what's going on in their body. But the number one thing you want to be doing is, is telling them you're doing a great job, you're in this quit attempt, keep at it, try to abstain from your tobacco use. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. If someone wants to ask a question and unmute themselves, please feel free to. Yeah, and just um, while we're waiting for any additional questions, um, we will be taking the questions and answers from the three sessions from this week and dropping them into a document, and that document will be placed up on the website for all of you to refer to at a later time. So Michelle's going to talk about that, um, and um, I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Great. Thank you so much, Heather. And be sure to, we'd love to get your feedback about today's session. So in the chat box, Evelyn is posting just a really quick link. We promise it's super painless just to complete the evaluation. We always love to hear 
what future sessions you're looking forward to so we can develop and roll out those programs to you. So we thank you, Heather, for such a wonderful presentation today on an overview of tobacco treatment. And by the end of the week, we'll be sending everyone out a link to our screennj.org website and we'll house you know, the recorded session for um, each of the different five weeks of the Be In The Know program, as well as any supplemental material. So we'll also be sure to get that FDA approved list of medication up there by popular demand. So be sure to join us next week. We have a wonderful guest presenter, Aberly Bagasse from the New Jersey Quit Line, and she will be presenting on Ask, Advise, Refer, a Brief Tobacco Intervention Module. So we don't want to take up any more of your time today. We always like like to end on the hour. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Be well and stay healthy. Thanks, everybody.